The USS Cooperstown was named to honor the 70 Hall of Famers who sacrificed their baseball career to serve in the United States military during wartime. Never really did I ever have any uh, second thoughts about being involved. I think I did the right thing. I could probably stayed out of service, but uh, I didn't do that. I'm not sorry I, I didn't do it either. He missed a season in his prime to serve his country in the Navy. States of America, I christen thee Cooperstown. May God bless this ship and all who sail in her. I would like to be remembered as a fellow that gave everything that I possibly could. The USS Cooperstown commissioned there on Saturday. Uh, obviously, Joe Torre is going to be there. His brother fought in World War II. And Johnny Bench, of course, there, too. He's our pal, Hall of Famer. His uh, dad, Ted Bench, fought in North Africa and Italy during World War II. And he says hello. Ted is the guy who told John to be a catcher, easiest way to the major leagues, and obviously a World War II uh, vet. Uh, how about your dad's influence, uh, Johnny? Let's start with that. Uh, I'm sure he's a no-nonsense guy, you know, part of the greatest generation. How about him teaching you some baseball in the uh, late 50s, early 60s? Go ahead. Let me hear that. Well, you, know, you know, Chris, he, he dropped out of high school. As the war started, he dropped out. He still had six months to go. And he dropped out of high school to join the Army. I uh, served at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And uh, his whole dream in life was to be a major league catcher. That's all he ever wanted to do. But the, the war came along, and like so many of our Hall of Famers that served, so many of our players that served, not just the Hall of Famers. But he uh, served in North Africa and Italy, served eight years. He re-upped. He came back with a dream that was really now shattered because he was 25 years old, and he really did have it. And I used to go watch him play Sandlot baseball. Uh, he act we actually played against Satchel Page at that time. And it was amazing that I was able to face Satchel Page in 1966 in the Carolina League. But Dad made contact, and that's all he ever cared about was the fact that I hit satchel page and the, to him that was the biggest thing but he wanted one of his sons to follow in his footsteps i was fortunate enough to be found in that small town of binger oklahoma and uh and uh, i guess the rest is history i'm just glad the analytics and all the saber metrics and is that after brett saber again no uh, the saber metrics and uh, uh, all the stuff wasn't around because i might not have been drafted uh it's hard to think that a kid from wow. the town of 660 people could ever make it to the major leagues uh, did Ted see you play uh, in, in, you know, the 75, 76 World Series? Was you still alive to enjoy those great years that you had, the MVP in 76? Obviously, the home run against Justy, we've discussed an awful lot. Was your father alive to share it with you, John? Oh, yes, yes. I moved him up to Cincinnati. He came to all the games. Uh, and uh, in 1989, when I was inducted, he was sitting there in the front row. And I told people, I said, oh, I'm not was. the one really okay. coming in. Uh, that was the World Series of 76. I'm not the one really going in. Uh, it's my dad. And uh, that was a pretty good game there. That was game four of the World Series in 76. Um, but, yeah, he's the every swing and his shoulders, and he would demonstrate up there on the stands, and he would, you could hear him and do it. And every now and then you could hear him when Tom uh, Don Gullett's dad brought the uh, moonshine. You could hear him a little bit louder. I thought, you know, it's funny. I didn't realize that I watched your documentary again, which the MLB Network did. I didn't realize you had such a off year for you in the 76th season. I know you were so great up until then. Not great in the regular year, but then you were wonderful in the postseason, capped, uh, obviously capped by that Yankees series. What made you, what, where'd you find it? Give me a little rundown of why the stark difference, regular season, and then, of course, the World Series against the Yankees. Well, in, in 75, I got uh, ran over at home plate. I had six cortisone shots every every six weeks. Uh, every uh, six weeks, they would give me six cortisone shots. And I had trouble getting my hands to load. I would go like this. But when I was this point here where the AC joint is, the cartilage was severely damaged. And so I had to get those shots every week. And I couldn't, I couldn't get loaded. And so when I couldn't get loaded, I thought of Rocky Calavito. And I started pointing the bat at the pitcher so that when I pointed it, I could bring it back and I could load. And, and if you'll look at the playoff stats, when we played against the Phillies uh, and then into the World Series, 
I hit, uh, I don't know what I hit in the, in the playoffs and the World Series was a good one as well. But I just sort of found out I could get my hand started and the timing began. And it did. You know, and I was thinking about this. We're going to do a turn back time on Willie Mays. Uh, about his uh, home run that he uh, hit the pass Ott. You were, uh, you know, probably on the bench when Bobby Tolan hit that ball out uh, to center field in, I think it was in 70, when Willie made that great, uh, great catch in right center and Bonds watched at Candlestick. Do you remember that great catch that Willie made there in the 70 uh, Candlestick Park early in the year with the Reds? Go ahead. Unbelievable. Up against the wire fence and everything else, and they both kind of uh... – they both kind of were merging at the same time. And it was like all of a sudden, you know, Bonds is actually looking at him saying, how in the, how is that possible? Willie was, I start to laugh every time you mention Willie's name because he was one of my most favorite people ever in my life. And he meant so much to me in the, in the all-star game in 70 and in, in the Astrodome in 1968, I take it back 1968, he was sitting across from me and he walked over to me and he said, you should have been the starting catcher. And I, it meant so wow. much to me. And so, Willie was the guy that throughout my career was always uh, funny and, and witty and always uh, a gentleman. And I and even after I retired, we had a very we have a very close relationship. And, you know, I, I miss him so much. But uh, Willie was just I mean, Willie was Willie. I mean, it was just amazing. And sometimes we try to find ways to find other players that are better. But it's hard to think that anybody could be better than Willie Mays. He's 92 on Saturday. Uh, what was the better Reds team? The one that lost to the Mets in 73 or the one that lost to the A's in 72? Uh, well, uh, the, the one that lost to the Mets was, was good, was great. I mean, I, it, it was good. We became a great ball club when the trade with Houston came around. Joe Morgan was the the guy that came over to second base with Jack Billingham won 19 games. We had Dennis Minky. We had one of the great center fielders of all time, really Cesar Geronimo, who was the most unheralded player that would, that anybody could ever have. Uh, he hit 300. He had defense was incredible. He won the gold glove. Um, and it's hard to think that, you know, in 1976, when we swept the Yankees with Dan Dreesen as the uh, designated hitter, that we weren't pretty good as well. But, you know, those years of 75 and 76, we led the league in ERA, and nobody talks about Gullett and Billingham and Nolan and Freddie Norman and Zachary and all the guys that really meant so much to that pitching staff, plus our bullpen of Bourbon and Carroll, Will McEnany, Raleigh Eastwick. It was just, we were just a complete solid team that really played through injuries and through it. We played, you know, we were out there every day. We did, we may have been hurt, but we were playing. Uh, I didn't realize until I watched it again that Darcy, you knew, had nothing. Uh, in his, what, third inning of work when Fisk hit the home run there in the 12th and 76, you knew that bad scenario was forthcoming with Pat on the mound trying to gut out another inning. How about that for a sec? Go ahead. He, he went out, he pitched 11th, and it was just unbelievable. I mean, his stuff was boom, boom, boom. And the next thing you know, we go out to warm up in the 12th, and, and it was like I was trying to go, hurry, get here. And it was like it just wouldn't arrive. And I looked over at Sparky in the dugout, and I said, no chance. You know, and, and Carl was the guy. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to do? You're going to say, hey, boy, he's really throwing good. And we all they had was Clay Kirby was left, and he was arm was broke, basically. He couldn't come out of the pen. So it was just a matter of what happened. You knew it was coming. But, you know, that, 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 that thing had so many things. Bernie Carmo. We were drafted in the first uh, in the same round, or he was in first. I was second in, in the Carol in 1965. We were roommates in Tampa. We were roommates in in the Carolina League. He was absolutely. We called him the Rocket. He had two pinch hit home runs in that series, and he said, and it was just like he had the worst swing ever, and then he had the greatest swing ever, and the greatest catch. I don't care I don't where you want to go. Except I saw this guy the other day turn backwards with his glove like that. I think it was in the Angels and made the catch, whatever it was. But uh, Dwight Evans made that catch in right field that I will – and double – it turned out to be a double play uh, that really changed the that way that went. In the ninth inning, I got crossed up on a pitch that Will McEnany threw me. He was supposed to throw me a slider. He threw me a fastball. It popped up down the left field line. George Foster catches it, throws it to me. I tag Denny Doyle out, and it's a double play. And I said, Will, for goodness sake, you crossed me up. And he said – 
Yeah, well, sometimes those things work out, don't they? And walk back to the mountain. <laughs> and I, I'm just standing with the umpire. <laughs> and he said, what's going on? I said, you wouldn't understand. This is very scientific. Oh, a lot of things have gone on. Yeah, 100%. Uh, like, uh, how hard, well, last thing, Johnny, how hard, how hard was it to be the last red standing? You know, they traded Perez, Rose leaves, Morgan goes to a lot of different teams. I mean, in a lot of ways, you were the last great red sitting there in the late 70s. Uh, give me a little rundown on that for a sec. Go ahead. Well, I probably had a little longer uh, standing in Cincinnati. I was working for the bank and for 37 years. I worked with them. I had a. I was going to be the broadcaster for the Reds. I, I looked like hopefully everything else, and I just I just couldn't see myself leaving a town that I loved. And uh, uh, you know, when they traded away Perez, it kind of took the steam out of our ball club. We lost our heart and soul. And then, of course, Pete going one way and Joe going the next, and then and Don Gullett had left to go to the Yankees. It's it's it was tough. It was tough, and you could see you could see the writing on the wall. And that's one of the reasons that I retired. Well, my elbow, I couldn't, I couldn't hold a throw anymore, and my back was bad, and and I was just, you know, the warranty had ran out on all the parts, and it was just easy decision for me to say, hey, I, this is not it. I'm not earning my money. I walk away from a lot of money. I'm not earning it. I'm, and the ball club's going nowhere. They need to spend it elsewhere, and so the decision was made that I was going to, I was going to retire. But it was sad to see that uh, team dismantled, and of course. You know, in those days, Bob Housen was the general manager, and he wasn't going to spend the money. He just he thought uh, free agency would be the downfall of baseball, and so he wasn't going to spend the money. And as a result, uh, the Reds were never going to develop what they needed to the farm system. And if you don't develop the farm system, you're going to suffer. And, and uh, we're suffering right now in Cincinnati. 100%, Johnny. Always a pleasure. You have a very good weekend. Looking forward to that USS uh, oh. Cooperstown deal on Saturday. You'll be wonderful. Always a pleasure. We will talk soon. Thanks for coming on twice in two months. Nice of you to Anytime. do that. All right. Thank you.